Coming up on this week's show, we pay tribute to Sir Clive Sinclair. A huge stash of gaming prototypes is discovered. And we catch up with modern vintage gamer about updating Quake. The Retro Hour podcast is brought to you each week with our amazing mates at Bitmap Books. Now, if you're a Super Nintendo fan, we're going to tell you more about this incredible book. The SNES and Super Famicom Visual Compendium, weighing in at over 500 pages and celebrating the best games on Nintendo's 16-bit wonder. You can check out that and their full range of retro gaming books at bitmapbooks.co.uk. Hello and welcome to the Retro Hour podcast, episode number 294, your weekly dose of retro gaming and technology news with me, Dan Wood. Me, Ravi Abbott. And me, Joe Fox. And welcome to this week's show, of course, a podcast that gets all nostalgic, takes you back to the golden age of video games and technology, and we bring you a very special guest on each week's show, which we'll be getting into more on that in just a moment. But actually, it is kind of bittersweet because um, this has been the week particularly here in the UK, when retro gaming and computing has really been in the limelight. I mean, I, you know, I, I work at a radio station during the day. We're running out on our news there. I saw this on the BBC, on Sky. It's been on the you know, newspapers, magazines, all over the place. The, of course, last Thursday, we sadly lost a true pioneer of British computing in particular, and that was Sir Clive Sinclair, who passed away last Thursday at the age of 81. Yeah, he really was a pioneer. Like, all of the mm. stuff he did was really, really ahead of time, even sometimes too ahead of time, like, uh, especially yeah. looking at stuff like the C5. But to me, like, Clive Sinclair really represented the 80s, and he was kind of lauded as, like, the, um, you know, 80s. He was knighted, and he was he was lauded as the kind of 80s industrial Britain. And, uh, you know, he's just such an iconic guy here. Maybe... Not throughout the world, but you can see his uh, kind of influence still in computing. You know, I saw some really nice tweets from many friends of ours, you know, who've had on the show before. Dominic Diamond did a really good one. He said, you know, the entire British gaming industry today stands on the shoulders of giants. And without Sinclair, you know, it wouldn't be anything like it is today. The amount of kids who got Spectrums, you know, as their first computer, even though, you know, you and I, Ravi, you know, we, we're always Commodore boys mainly, and, you know, Joe was a console guy, but it's undeniable that, you know, it just enables so many people to not only get into video games, but also start making them as well, which is one thing I've noticed. I mean, a lot of the articles, there is a really nice write-up on The Guardian that I'll link up in our show notes, kind of a, um, a retrospective of what he meant to the, um, the the author of this article. But a lot of the things I read are just talking about, you know, Jet Set Willy and that kind of thing. But I think it's important to remember that also he enabled programming. Because when you, you got a, a Spectrum, for example, like many machines at the time, you plugged it in and it dropped you straight into basic. And it really encouraged kids to actually try out making their own software and mainly games. But, you know, without that, the industry wouldn't be anything like it is today. Yeah, was, and he, he wasn't the biggest fan of games as well, was he? But, you know, it mm. did birth a whole generation of, like, game creators and designers, and uh, some, some amazing stuff came out of that. And also, in the future, you know, we've had so many guests that have talked about their history with the Spectrum and how it was, you know, their first machine and, and really got them into computing. I was literally just going to say what Ravi just said. He's completely <laughs> hit the nail on the head there. Pretty much every other guest, you know, we have on where I'm involved in the interview... You know, they say they started on the spectrum, and if it wasn't for that, they wouldn't be doing what they're doing today, which, you know, just goes to show how much of an influence he was on so many people. Because when you talk about the early days of computing, often, you know, we hear about, like, the, the Altair in America and the Commodore Pet and that kind of thing. But here, I mean, you could get a ZX81 that you could walk into Boots or WH Smith or buy it from a catalogue, and it cost £70, which obviously, you know, was a lot of money in like the early 1980s, but it was just affordable to a lot of families. So really, that was the first time that we started to see home computers coming into people's homes. Well, it was it was in the recession and it was mm. it was like a really hard time and people couldn't afford machines. And it was like, actually, this is a computer for that amount of money. And people just really took it to heart and used it. But also stuff like the C5, you know, electric vehicles are now huge and... Uh, he was innovating back then, even though it wasn't the safest thing. And, uh, you know, it had the mickey taken out of it a bit. I still loved the design of the C5. It looked slick. Like, everything they produced had a certain look to it, didn't it? And uh, just, you know, the lines and the uh, kind of curves on the machine and stuff. Re really nice. 
Yeah, I know what you mean, though, because everything back then, when you look at a Sinclair product, they had that certain aesthetic. Like, I'm looking over at my QL now, you know, obviously that Rick Dickinson design on there, it just looks so mid-80s and of its time, you know, that kind of sleek black look that it had. So, um, yeah, I think, obviously, Sir Clive, we didn't ever manage to get him on the podcast. We did try. I know a lot of people have been like, oh, it's a shame you never got him on. Because famously, you know, the last few years, he was quite reclusive and he wasn't a technology user. I heard he didn't even have a mobile phone, but we managed to get his postal address, but obviously he hadn't been well, so it never happened. But I, I did actually listen again over the weekend to the episode that we did with Nigel Searle, who was um, Clive's right-hand man, wasn't he, for a long time, um, and did a really good episode kind of talking behind the scenes at Sinclair and just how much admiration he had for Sir Clive as well. So um, if you want to check that out, we did that back in uh, January last year, but definitely a very sad loss to the industry. So um, rest in peace, Sir Clive, and uh, thank you for starting the industry here in the UK. Now, we have got a incredible guest on this week's show. Now, some people might be looking and thinking, oh, haven't you had Modern Vintage Gamer on the show before? There are some guests that we get on who we just get value out of so much because they do so many different things. And we always like having a regular catch-up. And I think it's been about 18 months since we last had Dimitris on, but he's been really busy recently, including working on that um, recent update of Quake that we are talking about recently. Yeah, you can't get enough MVG, can you? So <laughs> Modern Vintage Gamer <laughs> is like... Really amazing because his YouTube videos, you know, he'll talk about the background and he's been doing a great series of like about piracy and kind of how things were cracked and working on machines because he's got a great understanding of these things. And uh, he's actually been working as a senior developer on the Quake mm. project, which is the new version of Quake with, you know, 4K resolution, widescreen, better lighting. And that's with um, Night Dive, ID Software, Machine Games and Bethesda as well. So... We're going to have a, a talk about Quake, the history behind it, also a bit about his channel. But, you know, he was focusing on the console port, so like mainly the PlayStation and Xbox and Switch. And he actually has a bit of a history um, in this, which is in 2003, he did a console port himself of Quake, which was called Quake X. And mm. um, that was for the Xbox. And that actually had uh, Quake World, which is the multiplayer mode on it. So that's a pretty decent kind of port to have quake world on it back then and now of course with the new one you've got a cross-platform multiplayer which mm. is just absolutely amazing and you know we haven't covered quake that much on mm. the podcast and it's, it's such a huge title you, you're right as well because we we find we talk about doom pretty much every, doom episode. On every episode <laughs> you know where is quake it's, I wouldn't say it's as influential but that's my personal opinion some people would probably say it's more influential but yeah, Quake's massive. We don't talk about it enough. So, like Dan says, it's really good to get him back on again and talk about it. Yeah, and whenever we have Dimitris on, it's, they're always some of our most popular episodes. So, yeah. uh, we know that you guys love <laughs> that it. That helps as well. As well. So. <laughs> I, I don't know. Is there more Quake games than Doom games? You know, there's there's there's, there's, there's quite a lot there of might both be, of them. Actually. Yeah. There's a lot yeah. of both of them. Yeah. There's definitely a lot of ports of both of them. There's our first question to him when he's on the show in around <laughs> 25 minutes from now. Dimitris from uh, Modern Vintage Gamer coming up on the show right after we get through this week's news stories. Now, it has been another busy week for news. Now, there is, does seem to be a bit of a trend at the moment of, um, you know, I was talking about Life is Strange and me spending time on that Arkanoid game that's in there. And there's a bit of a trend about putting um, retro games into modern games at the moment, but this one just takes it to the next level. Now, this is the latest game in the Yakuza franchise, Lost Judgment that actually should be out today at the time this episode gets released on uh, Friday, September 24th. And there is around, is it 20 retro games from Sega that appear in here? Yeah, so this made me laugh when I saw this because I thought, oh, another game for Dan to play on his PS5 to play <laughs> retro games on. So yeah, um, this is Lost Judgment, which is the sequel to Judgment, which was a spin-off of the Yakuza games. Um I feel like I'm not too familiar with the Yakuza games, but I really want to play this one because of because of the Sega <laughs> because of the old games, games because of the old games in it. Um, but yeah, it's a spin-off from the Yakuza games, which I feel like there's a, a new Yakuza game like every six months at the moment. But yeah, you you play as um, obviously the main character, and in his office there is a Sega Master System, which I just thought was so awesome. And on the Master System, you can literally like while you're sat at your office chair, you can look, look over, click on the Master System, and you can play within the game Alex Kidd in Miracle World, Fantasy Zone, Penguin Land, Quartet. Enduro Racer, Woody Pop, 
Maze Hunter 3D and Secret Command. But as well as that, while you're out beating up bad guys, you know, solving mysteries, being a cop, you can go into the Sega Arcade in Tokyo and you can play <laughs> the arcade versions of Space Harrier, Super Hang On, Fantasy Zone, Fighting Vipers, Sonic the Fighters, which is really interesting, Motor Raid, and then Virtua Fighter 5 Final Showdown, which we actually spoke about the other month on the show. And I still well. consider a new game. I still consider yeah. that it's 2010, you know, yeah, a decade yeah, ago, yeah. I guess. But. And then as well as that, there's going to be DLC for the Master System <laughs> where you can play Sagara, Fantasy Zone 2, Alien Syndrome, and Global Defense. So there's quite a lot of retro games in there to play. Uh, which or in already like a triple A looking game? Do you know what I mean? I think I think the problem is though, if if you're playing a Yakuza game, your fingers can get cut off. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> see if you'll be able to play them well, or if you <laughs> lose a few buttons, you know. That definitely appeals to retro gamers there as well, because I mean, I've got stuff like the Mega Drive collection, you know, that is limited to one system. Yeah. But you know, having actual fully playable arcade games in there, I yeah. think, is extremely cool. Yeah, I mean, Sonic the Fighters on there. This is why the article caught my eye, because the article, which we'll link up, you know, kind of focuses on the fact that Sonic the Fighters is on there, because that's such an obscure game. Which was that an arcade game? It was an arcade game. Yeah, it was. It was an arcade game. I've never seen it. And we never got a home. I don't think we ever got. I could be wrong, but I don't think we ever got like a Sega Saturn version of it. I could be wrong on there, or I think we might have done in Japan. But it's a yeah. Really... I'm, lo- I'm looking here. Yeah, apparently it was cancelled on the Saturn, but then yeah. they they put it out on the Sonic Gems collection on the GameCube and PS2. Yeah, so it's it's not a common one that you know pops mm. up a lot. And you know, you mentioned there like the, the Mega Drive collections and stuff. We've got a really different lineup of games here compared to those mm. you know the mega drive collections and master system collections that you usually get like you know we've got some very very different games on here i mean you've got space harry and super hang on fantasy zone but you know sonic the fighters virtual fighter penguin land <laughs> you know maze hunter <laughs> that, that, that i just feel like they're ones that don't pop up very often so you know yeah. tempted to buy this because the game itself does look <laughs> really fun but this has like existed for a long time like uh duke nukem 3d you could go mm. in and play one of the arcades. Yeah, yeah and, this uh, isn't this isn't a new thing, you know. Like Dan says, we spoke about this a lot. There was a Call of Duty, you know, about a year or two ago, where you could collect Activision cartridges and play them in your arcade in in your home base and stuff like that. So it's, it's you know, like you say, Duke Nukem did it. So Time Splitters Two did it as well. It's it's definitely not a new thing, but it just seems to be like these things are getting more and more ambitious and bigger and bigger. You know, I, I, mean? I wonder if it actually counts as like a ROM. As, a, as a having a licensed copy or something. So, you know, if oh, you yeah. download a ROM and they try and sue you, then you can go, but I've got Yakuza and it's got Fantasy Zone. <laughs> and then they yeah, go, yeah. Oh, that one doesn't count. Oh, yeah. you know. I paid 65 quid just to play Alex Kidd in Miracle World. Yeah, yeah pretty much. That's the, that's what Dan's going to end up doing, let's be honest. Yep. <laughs> so, yeah, very cool. And uh, long may this trend continue of putting in um, old school arcade games into modern games and, you know, really pushing the power of my PlayStation 5. Now, if you want to go a bit more old school, um, this is really cool. And actually, I guess Modern Vintage Gamer, so he just did a video on this, so we'll have to ask him about it in the interview. Uh, But nearly 500 Xbox and Dreamcast prototypes and unreleased games have been found. We've covered this before. So this was uh, Project Deluge, but the problem Mm. about Project Deluge was it was so big (laughs) that they Mm, have to go through it through different titles. So initially they focused on... um, ports of the playstation and yeah. uh now they're going into dreamcast and uh xbox and god yeah 349 xboxes and 135 um dreamcast prototypes have also been released and a lot of these some of these were unreleased versions and uh some of them were like you know alpha versions and uh, mm. yeah. uh, uh different builds yeah like you say this is the third dump they've done so they did the nintendo one as well or hidden palace did now what caught my eye was the 135 dreamcast prototypes i feel like that's like half the dreamcast line. yeah <laughs> <laughs> um, that's a hell of a lot of games now you know it's including we've got xbox games is here as well but like we've got the ports of pac-man world rally he-man defender of gray school um american idol so one of dan's favorites there the game <laughs> oh yeah also xbox original versions of Hail to the Chimp, which was eventually a 360 game. Um, so 
no, nothing stand out, you know, no, no, like, oh, there's Mario 64 again on there or anything like that. But I think it's cool to see this, you know, so people can go back and look at it on the website and stuff like that, you know, kind of like a historical kind of, how would I call it? What, how would, what would you call this? It's like, like a little museum, online yeah. museum, really, isn't it? I suppose. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, and there's early versions as well. Jack Grind Radio, Four Wheel Thunder, um, Tony Hawk's Pro Skater, like early builds of the Dreamcast version of that. Um, and it, they literally, they're in the thousands of games now from Project mm. Yeah, uh, they, they, they're, they're saying they've got CDI prototypes as well yeah. and uh, yeah, Saturn. Yeah. And, and the thing about this was they were actually on like physical gd roms or cd roms yeah or dvdrs so they probably had to go through these and like rip them all and then try and find out what the content is and yeah keep going it's, on it's, it so it's maybe there'll be a further release you know the, the, i i have got no doubt that there'll be a fourth release but they're a year and a half into this now which is absolutely crazy and we got from this this is where we covered about six months ago the golden eye arcade yeah, version yeah. you know the xbox arcade version and also um the dinosaur planet uh, the original kind of Star Fox, is it Star Fox Adventures it's called, for the GameCube, the original kind of version of that, which was like a famous, you know, kind of unreleased game, you know, so I'm pretty sure somebody will probably pick through this 500 odd games they've just released and probably find some obscure demos out there for us to but, check well, out, which I'm sure we'll probably talk about in the next couple of weeks. I'm, I'm a sucker for tennis games and there's a, a screenshot here of an unreleased US Open game, which... Looks pretty slick. Looks pretty pretty clean. And uh, I was going to say, isn't virtual tennis like your favourite Dreamcast game? <laughs> oh mate, yeah, yeah. I don't know what it is. With I'm awful at tennis. Like I think I lose my breath after like <laughs> <laughs> just playing a little bit. But uh, man, tennis games are just so good. That's just... playing the Dreamcast version. You lose your breath. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. I just hold my breath. <gasps> you know, what I think it's interesting though. I've been looking through kind of how they have acquired most of these games. Because mm. I mean, we've obviously got stuff like the Giga League. You know, servers were hacked and that kind of thing. But it appears most of this, from what I can see, it's all kind of above board. There's nothing like that that's gone on. A lot of them apparently from um, like kind of pre-release versions that were sent to old magazines or they bought them in, you know, kind of um, publishing companies or old software companies that have gone out of business and had estate sales. Yeah. So they've all come from like legit places. And actually they, they said they ripped them off old physical media. And I remember even talking about um, Amiga games that you get on – a cover CD or, you know, when you used to get the PlayStation demo discs, a lot of the time, kind of the early versions of the game will be quite different from the release version. Yeah. yeah so it's yeah. quite interesting that they've kind of, you know, archived a lot of that stuff as well. Sometimes the early versions would be better. You'd have features in there, which yeah. you're like, oh, I wish this was in the final. And, you know. Yeah. Um, do, you, do you remember a game called um, Jaguar XJ220? Yeah. It was yeah. Um, by Core. I remember the demo of that was incredible and that the finished game was nowhere near as good. And I was, you know, very disappointed when I got um, hold of it. Also, like we said earlier, fanboys and like, you know, for people really into these kind of systems will look it up and they'll go, oh, this is how this changed. Or, you know, mm. there may be new assets or, or new characters in, in a lot of these games that they could suddenly add to, you know, the, the wiki of the game or, or just like increase the knowledge of it. Yeah, and if you want to help out, I mean, like you said, this is a massive community effort, which I think is the the only way that something like this can work, isn't it? Having a group of people together who are all working on it. So um, I'll link up their Wikipedia page on uh, hiddenpalace.org on how you can get involved and how you can uh, actually check out some of these unreleased games that they've uncovered. But yeah, I think that's extremely cool. Now, this next story was submitted by uh, Gid on our Discord channel. We haven't spoken about Discord for a while, but actually we do have quite an active Discord channel, don't we, where people submit news stories and we chat away most days on there? Yeah, it's really good. We have like news suggestions and also people suggest guests, but a lot of the time it's like, have you got that guest? Uh, could you have this person as a guest? And we're like, they've been on the show already. <laughs> with, with so many. But also we have uh, our supporters chat as well and stuff. So it, it, it's really cool. Yeah, Discord. And if you have a spot on your news stories, you think that'd be great for the guys to cover. You know, there's actually a channel dedicated to that on our Discord. So you'll find all that in our show notes. And uh, Gid sent us this one. This is really cool. This is an artist called uh, Nick Vivid. And you know... I mean, Joe, you're in the music industry, of course. You know, before you get your video made, which, you know, filming a music video, which I know you've done actually in the last couple of years, it's actually quite a big effort, isn't it? Actually getting a song and a video that kind of all syncs up and everything and takes it look cool. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> we're we're only small, so we're pretty bodge job. <laughs> but yeah, it, it is a hell of a lot of effort, yeah, to kind of get it all organised and then 
actually edit it and make it. You know, I wouldn't know where to start with that kind of stuff, but luckily I've got quite a talented guitarist in my band who tends to do a lot of that kind of stuff for us. But yeah, it's a hell of a lot of time investment as well. Just on the haircut. That's yeah, well, yeah, that as well, yeah. <laughs> I remember when I was at college, and, I, you know, this is kind of before, because my college was a bit behind anyway. We definitely didn't have, like, digital video editing or anything. Um, it was just VHS tapes, you know. I remember for our final project, I was like, oh, I want to make a music video. And our, our lecturer was like, you know, that is a hell of a lot of work. Don't do that. So, um, you know, back in the day, difficult. Even now, it's still a challenge. But a lot of artists actually put out um, lyric videos. Yeah. Now, these are very common things before you've got the main video film, kind of teaching your fans, you know, the lyrics to your songs, a kind of a bit of a placeholder before the main video is ready. Well, this is an artist from New York called Nick Vivid, and he's made a new single called Trainers. What stands this video out from the crowd is the entire thing was made on a Commodore 64. As we know, Trainers, that's got a bit of a, you know, it's a scene thing, isn't it? A trainer was kind of those, uh, the bit that popped up before a crack game where you could enable lives and, you know, skips and continues and that kind of thing. Well, if you look at the video, which I'll uh, I'll link up as well, it definitely can tell at first glance, this is a Commodore 64 crack throw at the start there. You got that kind of, uh, you know, the the Commodore 64 effect there, uh, the fonts and everything. Then it kind of goes into it. And the, the video, they've got the lyrics along the bottom, like a scrolly kind of text demo. And it looks like a Commodore 64 game. It looks like Leisure Suit Larry. Yeah, it does it actually. <laughs> yeah. It's got that kind of vibe. But um, th- this is an impressive little kind of piece of work. And he said he coded it himself, which is pretty cool to have, you know, multi-talented people like that. But you can also tell it's American because it says 25 cents to pay yeah. at, at the very <laughs> beginning. <laughs> Yeah, because he's saying when he was a kid, again, like a lot of us who, you know, had computers, um, not consoles, and actually, you know, managed to get um, acquire games from friends, shall we say. He said when he was a little kid, he was really fascinated by the computer pirate groups, and particularly the way he, he describes it as graffitiing an intro onto a game with scrolling text and graphics before it went out into the wild. Because really, I mean, you know, I've still got a lot of them now in my drawer here, like Amiga discs, and a lot of them you put on, and sometimes the crack throws are more impressive than the games themselves. <laughs> yeah, and and also that was kind of on, big on the C64 scene as well, wasn't it? Yeah. So, um, you know, it had it had roots in there, and uh, it's it's really interesting to see this. I remember Junior Senior did a, did a video, yeah. but I think they hired a design agency, and that was all done in the Amiga. And, uh, yeah, it's just nice to see the Commodore system getting a bit of love, and also... You know, probably kids are like looking at this going, oh, cool, retro. (laughs) It's in trend now, isn't it? Yeah, well, the video only went up a couple of days ago. It's only 5,000 views so far, and he's got an album coming out called No More Secrets um, at the start of November. It's actually, I think it's quite, you know, it's quite a funky little tune as well, actually. Um, Can't play any of it for copyright reasons, just in case. But um, if you want to check it out, I mean, the video is really impressive. If you love that Commodore 64 art style Definitely worth a look, and uh, you know, maybe Jane you know, for your next video. Yeah, I was thinking maybe you can get, get Ravi to program one for me. Oh God, no! <laughs> <laughs> That'd be the worst video ever. <laughs> this this is a triangle. <laughs> <laughs> now, this is another thing that's come out of YouTube. Actually, this is a YouTube duo who found a hundred thousand dollars of vintage games in an abandoned house. Is that one water game? <laughs> yeah, that's it. It's just one game. No, not 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 quite. So this is two YouTubers, a duo, a couple. Their channel's called Cheap Fine Cheap Finds Gold Mines, and uh, they're essentially they're called Amy and Corbin, and they are straight up resellers. You know, they do it full time for a living. Mm. You know, essentially going to like they're American, going to like GameStop and flea markets and stuff, and finding games to then flip for profit. You know, they try to double up on games, on cheap games, and then sell them on on eBay and stuff like that. And, you know, one of their main focuses at the moment, as as Ravi just pointed out, is sealed games. You know, finding kind of like PS2, Xbox, and GameCube kind of sealed games, because there's a lot of them still about, do you know what I mean? Because they're only kind of 20 years old. And essentially what happened was the video of this only came out a couple of days ago. But about a week or two ago, the city they live in, there's about eight resellers which are kind of known around the shops and stuff like that. And essentially they got a call saying, you know, there's this house where they're doing like an open house of games. And this was a retro game collector who's moved out. He's, he's an elderly unwell man. He's, he's moved out mm. of the house and 
his family are essentially auctioning off the games, you know, just come and buy them. And I don't think they were quite expecting when they got there. So it's a little bit of a sad story, but it's nice that they managed to recover these games. And obviously they're making money off it, but they're also saying, you know, it's good that they've been saved and preserved. So essentially they got to the house and this house is like falling apart. Like the roof has fallen through on it and everything. Like if you watch the video, I don't know if you guys have seen it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm watching now. But yeah. like it essentially turns out it's a hoarder's home and the house is absolutely, unfortunately, absolutely full of like rats and mice and mm. cockroaches and spiders and the ceilings have all fallen through and, they're, you know, it's all wet and there's just... There's just muck and dirt and everything everywhere. And essentially they're going through it and they're just finding hundreds, if not thousands of games. And they kind of pick through and they take all the sealed games. Um, but the family were like, they were just like filling up their pickup truck and the family were just like, yeah, a thousand dollars, you know, for that pickup mm. truck of like a thousand games. Do you know what I mean? They, they, the family just want rid of it, I guess, don't they? Yeah, the family yeah, just yeah, want yeah. rid of it, but... Yeah. what was nice is what amy says at the end of the video is you know yeah they're going to resell them and stuff like that but they're kind of saving a part of history because the house was going to get bulldozed down with it all in there mm. so they they have saved it and they they reckon they took about 20 percent of what was in there and they're they estimating that they're going to make about twenty thousand dollars profit off it um from what they took it'd be uh, nice if they gave some to the memorial or something you know, yeah for, for, for the dude yeah, Rather that would be nice, like, but I, look at what we got. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that would be nice. So, you know, there's a lot of videos out there on it. Um, one particular reseller who's from the same town who I watch is called Phoenix Resell, which is where I heard of it. And he buys a lot of their games from them to then resell because he sells on Amazon and they don't. But yeah, like apparently one of them got bit by a mouse while they were doing it and another one got bit <laughs> by a good. spider while they are doing this, it. And- this is like a phenomenon. Like I saw in Nottingham there was a... A, a kind of hoarder's house and um he mm. passed away and then they, they came in and it wasn't in as bad state as this but it had like you know model train sets and gi yeah. joes mm. and stuff like all boxed he'd bought like double of everything and i'm sure yeah. there's these places where people are just completely surrounded by yeah video games and stuff like that and to be honest this guy probably didn't know what he had like well, he mm. must have had duplicates. He must they have had, you know. Spoke to the family apparently, and they they didn't kind of say a lot of what happened. But um, I don't even know if he passed away. It just said he fell ill in twenty nineteen. Yeah, and she helped him move out. And she so, helped him move yeah. out. But essentially, he had some sort of family tragedy, which they don't reveal. They don't have to um, around the time of you know PS two generation, and essentially. Um, he loved video games and that's where he found love and he just started buying everything. And, you know, he just, like you say, perhaps didn't really know the value of it, you know, of keeping it sealed and stuff like that. Yeah. It's just, there's a lot of things with this culture. Like even when, I, especially when I was in America, there's people with warehouses, warehouses yeah. full of stuff. You've probably seen it on um, yeah. LGR's uh, videos yes. as well. Yeah. yeah, and yeah. Stuff. It's uh it's huge. I can imagine with Britain with the smaller homes, um, <laughs> they're more got back. But I've even seen videos of you know people who have like farms and stuff, and they've yeah. they filled barns with stuff like this. So yeah, it's, yeah, you can only find this kind of stuff though. Yeah, I mean there is often quite a tragic story behind them, um, mm. and you know for people whose brains are wired that way, I mean you know some people collect. I've seen you know those hoarder shows on TV, and sometimes they collect you know butter. It yeah. could be like, you know, tubs of butter, they've got thousands of them. Which, at least out of this something, it, it is something that could be used again and hopefully earn the family some money that will yeah, have to Yeah, and, that, and the they can be loved again, again, the games, yeah. Yeah. you know what I mean, yeah. and used rather than like trashed or bulldozed. Yeah, like yeah, say, exactly. You know, you know and, and, and this is, you know, I've mentioned it like twice already, but this is the thing. They have saved these games from being trashed mm. and bulldozed and they will be loved by somebody else now do you know what i mean we, we always like to see games games saved i remember that one that we covered ages ago where there was a like a crate of them at a barn uh, yes. it was like a pallet wasn't it yeah 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 no it's always nice when they get saved and stuff like that um so yeah but if you want to check the video out it's a pretty long video on their channel all about it where they kind of explain it explain it better than we do but yeah, really, really crazy find. And and, and, and the know. thing about this video is you haven't got smell of vision as well. So there's this bit where they're standing there at the end with all the games and I'm like, oh, I bet they stank. Apparently they spent <laughs> a, a good few days kind of cleaning them up yeah, afterwards. Yeah. But yeah, it was <laughs> like, imagine. they were like buried in mulch. Do you know what yeah. I mean? Like, mm. it's just, yeah, the smell of it, I bet it smelled pretty damp and rotten. You know, whenever I get anything... 
off eBay or Amazon or whatever, if, if it's secondhand, I always run wet wipes over everything before I, I, I um, even... And, oh. and like, you know, I, now I receive someone when s- somebody's been smoking or something and I open it and I'm like, oh God, I've got to wear out the house, you know. Well, yeah, because I got that Atari 2600 I was talking about recently that my mother-in-law found for me on Facebook Marketplace and I must have used an entire pack of wet wipes on that and dirt was still coming off it. Looks pretty nice now, but yeah, anything you get second hand, I think it is generally a good idea to tidy it up yeah. so you don't know where Especially it's coming from. Especially if you're buying from CEX, some of the stuff. <laughs> is, it, <laughs> is it wipe fully? <laughs> Yeah, so good to see the games are going to new homes, though. And if you want to read more about that, watch the video. I'll link it up. And everything else we talked about in our show notes at theretrohour.com. Now, just before we chat to our special guest, Dimitris from Modern Vintage Gamer, talking about that amazing new version of Quake that he did and a bit of a catch-up as well, let's take a moment to give a massive thank you to one of our biggest supporters. This is our wonderful mates at Bitmap Books. Now, they've got so many incredible retro gaming books, and, you know, we're all huge fans of their books as well. I've got my bookshelf in my living room is creaking under the weight of all the bitmap books books I've got right now. Because these are not small books, are they? They're often very, very big and weighty. Yeah, often like 500 pages long, which is like absolutely crazy. But like you say, they've got that real nice weight to them and they are all hardback books as well, which is awesome. Now, this one is the Super Nintendo and Super Famicom Visual Compendium, which I've got here. As you can hear that, I mean, this is a solid book. 500 plus pages dedicated to... Nintendo's incredible 16-bit console that I know, it, again, we've done um, a patrons episode all about the Super Nintendo recently. We've all got such love for the SNES. And graphically, I think, you know, the, from that era, the Super Nintendo graphics are probably my favourite, you know, even over the Mega Drive, the look of the, the graphics on the SNES. So it was nice to have a book that's actually all about the visual look of the games. Yeah, they really, 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 bitmap books really capture the essence of the games with the pixel art. Like, they pick it up so so well on their pages like it's not like blurry or anything like that it does look amazing and what i also love because i've said this before i'm a simple man and i like a simple little bit of text about it they don't go too over the top you know with Mm. like the information about the games and stuff it's just right like a couple of paragraphs you know the release date you know who made the game um and then just you know what kind of game it is and a little bit about it which is absolutely perfect and you know there's hundreds of games in there yeah, and they give you like snapshots, a few little anecdotes as well, but mm-hmm. really it's celebrating the look of these games. And it just is. I mean, looking at it here, 500 plus pages printed lithographically to the highest standards because you look at their books and like you mentioned then, the images just jump off the page. They've got like a real high quality, almost luxury feel to these books, I'd mm-hmm. say. Um, the colours are just really vibrant as well. And it comes in a you know really nice protective board slipcase with an animated effect image on the front too so if you're a fan of the super nintendo this is a real celebration of that platform you need to get hold of it right now have a look on their website and you can check out their entire range of retro gaming books they're actually going to be reprinting this one from the 11th of october and there's been a big demand for it so make sure you check in their website as soon as those pre-orders are opening get yourself in there and hopefully you know find it in your christmas stocking this year as well so you get to this time of year i don't feel the same my family's already saying well, won't be long till christmas and your birthday any ideas stuff like this it's just fantastic so check out our good friends at bitmap books and thank you as always for their support of the retro hour podcast now we did have i think probably our best patrons hang out yet last weekend i think at one point we had um i think it was about 32 people on there a lot of new people who came in to the hangout last week as well which was really nice to see you know it continually amazes me that the people who come onto our patrons hangout just how not only knowledgeable but how nice they are as well and how chatty and it's just a great little community and how, how they get on, on with now. each other as well like we have yeah. new people that join straight away and they'll have conversations with the regulars and stuff and it's it's suddenly like we we just sit back sometimes and it's like you know just <laughs> yeah. let people chat or or all the familiar familiarities they have it's it's really nice and yeah we we had so many any kind of call that you do with like 30 people on it imagine doing it 30 people zoom chat with your uh yeah company you, you, you'd you know you wouldn't have good vibes for out there you'd have probably someone asleep and stuff like that but everybody seemed to enjoy it and uh it, it was a really good chat actually 
Yeah, and obviously we talked about a load of stuff on there. I mean, the idea of it is, you know, it, it's not always just about gaming or tech, and there is a lot of that as well. We often chat about movies and music. Obscure media always seems to come up when we're talking about loads about mini yeah, discs. Mini again discs this is week, like the default. Is, every time you, you guys always somehow Dan always brings it back to mini discs. <laughs> <laughs> and we're talking about building um, new computers in um, old hardware shells as well. Um, I've shown off this really cool, um, I think, on my retro computer that I picked up at Retcon that I was that last weekend um so i mean it is just really cool it's a bit like a users group as well and if you've got any like kind of tech problems or you want to get a hold of something often you know there's there's a really good collective knowledge there you know that people just know if, you, if you've got a question so they are really good and um, i'm all, already looking forward to next month as well so if you'd like to join us for the uh, the patrons hangout that we're going to be doing in october um good way to do it is to back us on patron right now and of course you get lots of other rewards as well don't you joe yeah, you also get the Retro Hour After Hours, which is our monthly extra After Hours Retro Hour show, um, where essentially a lot of people always ask us like for our opinion on certain games and game consoles and stuff like that. And that's where you kind of get a little bit more behind the scenes and a little bit more of our opinion on things, you know, a little bit more R rated as well, a lot of swearing in there, a little, you know, a little bit more attitude in there. and we Not, not lots of swearing. Not lots of swearing, but yeah, no, we, we get a little bit more of our opinion on there and stuff. For example, we have just done one this week um, all about the PlayStation and our favourite oh. PS1 games and PS1 memories. We, which... we were chatting so much on that that it was like, oh, we've got to finish it, we've got to finish it. <laughs> we're still chatting because we yeah. got so much nostalgia for that so system. much to talk yeah. about in that. And then we also do the video game years on it where we kind of talk about, you know, year by year, retro. You know, we've done like 99, 2000, 2001, 2002. Um, so we probably need to go start going backwards because I know we don't want to get too yeah. modern. Um, but then, <laughs> go to about 2005, I think. Then we yeah, that probably about 2004, yeah. 2005 <laughs> is probably going to be the cutoff with that. Um, but yeah, we do that every single month. Like you say, we've got the the hangout. Um, and then you also um, get the the episode completely ad-free for just being, you know, our lowest supporter. It's completely ad-free. And what we've also been doing now for about three or four months is rather than an advert, you get a cheeky extra news story as well, don't you? And you get the show early most weeks. Yeah, well, most weeks you do get the show early. So. You're usually about two, about two days early. Yeah, and on a Tuesday, Wednesday, you get it instead of Friday. Yeah. So um, obviously, depending on you know how long it takes me to edit, but yeah, <laughs> most weeks. Um, but yeah, really, I mean, the main reason that we have our Patreon is just to keep this podcast going because obviously we have running costs doing this. You know, we, we've talked about it. Lots of them, the show that we do, the show from home now, we have to buy equipment. We always need a bit of cash in the kitty to do stuff. So really, it means that we don't have to pay to do the show. With you guys' help, we can keep bringing out new episodes every Friday. It just lets us concentrate on the stuff we like doing, you know, telling you the news and getting these guests on as well. So thank you so much to everyone who supported the podcast over the last month. And let's give a mention to a bunch of our newest patrons. A big thank you to Christian Lee, Joe Presto. The Silver Foxhawk. Lee Bags and Richard Pickles who all backed us on Patreon we massively appreciate that and if you'd like to do the same you'll find it linked up on the front page of our website at theretrohour.com right then good friend of the show who um, is actually back for his third appearance now because I know you guys love him we all talk to him as well at this time modern vintage gamer Dimitris is going to be telling us all about updating Quake and a nice little catch up on his YouTube channel he's next on the Retro Hour podcast You're listening to the Retro Hour podcast, and it is time for the main event. Then, when we get a special guest on, and actually, I guess this week is no stranger to this podcast. I think you've actually got the uh, the accolade of being the the most frequent guest on this show now, Dimitris, having uh, been on three times because you're that incredible and you're that popular. We've got Dimitris from Modern Vintage Gamer. Hey, mate, how you doing? What's going on, gents? It's great to be back. Third time. Wow, that's uh, that's a great honor, and hopefully, um, it'll continue. I, I'll, I'll have the the pleasure and the privilege of being the uh the most recurring guest on the show so and feel free to bring me back anytime because i i love talking to you guys so thanks for having me on oh, it's really appreciated and uh, i mean you just do so much stuff as well not only your incredible youtube channel but games that you've worked on as well that obviously we're going to go into today mm -hmm. um but i thought it might be just nice to have a quick catch-up i mean it's been 18 months since you were last on the show and obviously we know how much the world has changed for us all in that time i mean how's the youtube channel going then and how have you kind of been over the last 18 months really busy i mean for me when the world is on fire so to speak the only thing i really know what to do is just put my head down and just keep working and and try not to to worry about the things i have no control over you know so um for me i've i've been very busy with the channel and um 
YouTube is going well. I mean, it's. I will say that the growth this year in in twenty twenty one has slowed down a little bit. Um, last year was a a pretty big year for me. If you look at you know where I started in in January all the way to the end of last year, um, the the numbers were a lot higher than they were this year. But it's still been very very good this year, um, and it's going really well. You know, the sub- subscriber counts are where they need to be, and the views are still there. And and I think you know. I think the last time you guys asked me, you know, what's what's next for for the channel, I think my answer back then was I don't know, you know, because yeah. I just I just kind of come up with things pretty quickly, and I also like to cover, I guess, current topics that that are going on in video games as well that pertain to, you know, uh, hacking and modding and stuff like that. Um, so really, it's just it's just been more of the same and 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 all that and. It's been uh, it's been a trip, no doubt about it. Well, if our listeners haven't checked out your channel, you've been doing some great stuff about um, unhackable devices and also um, stuff about like emulators and how the emulation scene's changing. You've just done one recently about PS4 mm. emulation, and uh, one that I found fascinating was about um, the reverse engineering of, of of GTA 3 and this kind of landmark court case which is happening because we know that usually emulators have like the assets of games in them and stuff and uh, this was a case where they reversed engineered it and didn't actually use the assets of the game yeah this one is an interesting one and and it's one that i you know i always want a signal boost when when we see things like this happen because take 2 seemed like they're a bit of a bully that go around and, and try to take these reverse engineering and, and modding sites down and this is certainly not the first time that they've they've done this i think it's probably the first time they've they're, they're suing someone but they, they tend to throw their weight around and um you know try to take down these modding sites and stuff and it's not just gta 3 i've seen it happen with gta 4 and and gta 5 with some of the modding you know communities out there but the reverse engineering one specifically is interesting because i mean at the end of the day, they're suing their own fans, you know, like th- these these people um, really love Grand Theft Auto. And what they're trying to do is, A, bring it to um, a newer audience and B, you know, adding quality of life features that really can enhance the game. And I think the fact that they are going after these people, um, you know, legally is, is really, really sad. And um, look, I, uh, I I am very very nervous about how this one's going to go. You know, like I think Take Two have all the money in the world, and and they can pretty much just again you know throw their muscle around and 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 really just shut this whole thing down. But I guess my biggest concern about all this Ravi is, you know, the precedent that may get set here because we're going back to the court case of you know Accolade and and Sega. You know, um, all those years ago where you know, reverse engineering kind of came away as as the winner of that. And it was it was okay to reverse engineer stuff as long as you did it the right way. You know, like you said, don't have any assets and stuff included and, and whatnot. But I'm just a little nervous that that may change after this 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 court case. You know, hopefully hopefully it does not, um, but we'll see how it goes. Is, is it like a easier process nowadays, reverse engineering, compared to like emulation and just having a, a kind of pre-built system that you're running something in it is um there are really really good tools out there to reverse engineer i think back in the old days um decompilers and things that would take you know binary files and and generate you know c code for example um were a lot more primitive and archaic and and maybe didn't work as well i'm sure there was there were some cool tools that you could use but these days you can use open source free tools that will deconstruct binary files for you and generate, I don't want to say perfect C code, but um, it, they're, they're really, really sophisticated. And a lot of people now are getting more into reverse engineering because the barrier of entry is so much easier. So there's definitely a, a, a push for much better tools. And the tools, like I said, right now are, are really, really good to use. One of my favorite series that you do is the um, Mistakes Were Made videos where you um, kind of explore, you know, how flaws were exploited and how DRM was defeated and kind of how companies' anti-piracy efforts have been overcome. Often, I mean, you're talking about 
preserving them, you know, for like future generations and that kind of thing as well, which we have obviously spoke about before and we think is important. I mean, a hell of a lot of research must go into these videos. And what are kind of some of the highlights that you've discovered in making that series? Um, really, it's just about like researching and and making these discoveries and sometimes learning things that even I wasn't aware of, you know. And I think, you know, if I look at that series, there's always something that surprises me with each episode that I've made. Um, and usually what I'll do is I, I, I tend to dig pretty deep. So I'm, I'm usually on like Web Archive and I'm pulling up articles from like 2003 and, and even earlier than that, depending on what I'm, you know, what the, what the video is. But, you know, there's always something interesting that, that comes up that I wasn't really that aware of at the time. You know, I know, I know like at a high level what the script will be and, and, and how I'm going to present it to my audience. But I usually find some really interesting stuff. Like, I mean, the one that, the one that I always think about is the Nintendo Wii. So the video that I made about the Wii being hacked with a pair of tweezers, that, mm. that wasn't actually anything that I was familiar with until I started researching everything. And I was like, this is absolutely amazing. This is fascinating. So things like that 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 you kind of read about just um, really are interesting. And the last one that I did was um, the Wii Mini, which was another interesting video that I made because I knew that the Wii Mini was um, was ultimately defeated with um, Bluetooth. Uh, I'd read about it last year, but what I didn't know was you could actually get. Game Boy games running on that system because I felt like I'm sorry, um, uh, GameCube games, not Game Boy games. Yeah. Um, I didn't think you could run GameCube games on on the Wii Mini, um, and as it turns out, you can. So there's always something you know that 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 surprises me when I when I when I dig into those series, and I think that's one of the reasons why you know people really like them, and especially stuff like the uh, Tony Hawk's um, Soft Mod that's actually just been recently discovered and uh, right. uh, stuff for the PS1. It's like there's still secrets of these consoles being found. Yeah, I mean, um, the other one that I did was the Sega Saturn about six months ago, and that was another really interesting video for me because the Saturn's always been a bit of an enigma um, as far as you know anti-piracy and how it all works. And um, reading into that and, and learning about the different methods that, that security can be defeated on the, on the Saturn was, was just an absolute trip for me. Uh, I, I really enjoyed that episode. And that was a Dr. Abrasive, wasn't it? Uh, with yeah. His, uh, so, VCD kind of um, pack, yeah. Yeah, th there's kind of a couple of different, different ways to do it. Um, Dr. Abrasives is obviously the, the, the big one, but there are other, other methods as well, you know, from the, the simple swap disk stuff, you know, to... Um, a chip that essentially manages a swap disk for you, and then the doctor abrasive method ultimately is is kind of the the one that really people really really like because it's it's not intrusive. You know, you don't have to open up the guts of the satin to actually um, you know to to hack the thing. Well, you know, a lot of people don't really cover piracy and stuff. And traditionally on kind of YouTube, I don't know if that's a, a popular category that goes down well with the YouTube people. Were you a bit worried with? Uh, actually covering this subject on the channel and maybe takedowns would happen with videos or something? Always. I mean, I think there's always that risk, right? Um, especially if you put the wrong word in a title um, that, that may get flagged, you know. Um, there's always that that risk, you know. But I think at the end of the day, I try to keep the content as, um, you know, as kind of high level and as accessible to to most people as possible so i'm not trying to put in you know the red flag you know keywords and stuff like that but i mean to your point ravi there's there's always that risk right that you know one day youtube's going to look at all this content and say we don't really want this we don't want we don't want advertisers you know running ads on these things so i guess that is the risk that you take but um i've been pretty fortunate with things like that and so far you know um knock on wood i've i've been actually pretty lucky so hopefully that can continue going forward and you're also very sensible in that, you know, you, you have more going on than just YouTube as well, which I think is always very wise. For sure, uh, yeah. Excited. Well, that's one thing I, I want to get into, because it's something we haven't really touched on when we've spoken to you in the past, but you know, outside of your channel, you're um, a very accomplished developer as well. So mm -hmm. let's kind of go into that a bit. I mean, how did you originally start with programming and developing them? What was kind of your backstory there? Well, originally, I mean, I was always someone that liked writing code, you know, from the earliest Vic Twenty machine that we that I got from my dad back in the eighties. Um, the first thing I did because we didn't have any games for it, we just had a tape drive and 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 you know no way to play games was to look at the the manual that came with it. And I you know you quickly realize well 
you can write your own games with basic even though they they weren't very good so really that's how it all started you know um and i guess long story short you know um i got a real interest in writing code you know from a very young age and went to college and and did a computer science degree and landed jobs um writing computer programs it wasn't in in video games but it was always C, C++ type jobs and then moved on to, you know, .NET jobs and, and things like that later, you know, web development. But I always was always interested in in game making and how games worked. You know, I was obviously someone that was a big fan of the Amiga as well. And just the demo scene stuff was really fascinating to me and, and how um, how effects would work and, and, you know, even the simple, you know, sine wave scrollers to the real kind of advanced stuff or at least the, the stuff that looks advanced and, um, was always something interesting to me. And the way that I ended up ultimately landing a job professionally in the games industry was was YouTube. So, um, you know, I made I made a video um, probably, I want to say about three years ago now, where when the Switch got hacked, I, I ported um, Diablo to the Switch. And um, it, it got a lot of attention. It got run in, you know, some of the big media outlets like Kotaku and, and IGN and, and, and stuff like that. And that ultimately is what got me noticed. Uh, I got a uh, tap. I got a DM from um, someone at Limited Run Games, and said, "Hey, would you be uh, interested in in working with us? You know, we we would love to to have you on the team. You obviously seem very competent. You know, we 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 love your channel and all that stuff. And um, would you be interested in in writing? You know, um, a, an emulation engine for um, for some games that we're working on to bring out and." Um, you know, for me, that's that was that was that was something that was almost a dream come true. When you know you finally get that knock on the door, you know, into the games industry because it was not anything that I ever um, knew how to pursue. You know, like um, I, I like again, you know, I was a competent developer, but um, as far as video games, I had no contacts and I had no one really that that was in that industry. So um, if I wanted to try to get into the games industry it was really just a matter of you know sending resumes out and usually that doesn't really go anywhere especially if you have no prior experience writing games so i jumped at the opportunity yeah it's kind of just gone from there um so i worked at limited run um as a contractor and i'm i'm still there now helping them out with with up and coming projects um but while i was working at lrg I also got um, asked from the uh, the CEO at Night Dive Studios uh, if I'd be interested in helping them with some porting projects that they had going on. So once again, I thought, well, why not? You know, this this sounds really awesome. So um, that's kind of how it all started. You know, it it was probably not the the traditional approach. You know, going to going to school and and getting uh, junior jobs, I guess. But um, you know, it, it it worked out in the end. Well, um, your first port, like a uh, uh, commercial port, was uh, Shantae for the Switch, and that's a wicked title. That's a real <laughs> good, fun, beautiful kind of title. What What did it feel like to actually like do a pro release? You know, that's a great question. Um, because I worked in homebrew for such a long time, a lot of it didn't feel that different. Like even the tools that that you get, right? I mean, obviously, you get you get to use you know, an official development kit and, um, and, and hardware. But I will say that the, the homebrew tools that are out for the switch uh, are pretty, pretty advanced. And, uh, you know, I guess for me, it wasn't a, uh, a difficult transition, you know, cause I'd already used the switch, um, before previously. So when I actually got to start using it in an official capacity, um, it was almost like just getting back on a bike, you know, and, and, because I kind of knew a lot of the stuff anyway, but um, as far as the feeling, um, it was it's fantastic. I mean, you're you know you're, you're in a situation now where you're you're making games, but you're not doing it as a hobbyist. You're doing it, and you're getting paid for it. And I think you know um, you know you want to make sure that you really deliver a quality product at the end of the day as well, because there are a lot of fans of Shantae out there that absolutely love that series. You know, and that was something to me that I was picking up when I was making this game uh, along the way, you know, just the, the fan base of that, of that series is, is huge and they love, they love the series. So I did want to make, make sure that, you know, we did, we did the best possible work that we could. And I think ultimately the product um, is a reflection of that. I was very, very proud of it. Well, see, the original game was a Game Boy Color title. Um, what was kind of the challenges of updating that to the Switch? 
Uh, I think ultimately, you know, we wanted to make sure that we brought some quality of life enhancements to a new audience because, yeah, I mean, it's a Game Boy Color game and it's always going to be a little stiff, you know, um, compared to, I guess, a, a newer iteration. So, you know, we, we added things like um, save states um, in the game so you could always go back and reload and, and, and things like that. We tightened up the controls as well a little bit. Um, we also really focused on the input lag um, and, and made sure that we got it as low as possible. Now, at the end of the day, it's it's still running um, emulation, Ravi. So there's going to be a couple of frames of uh, input lag, but it, there was also a release of Shantae for the Nintendo 3DS probably about seven or eight years ago now. And we wanted to make sure that our iteration of that was better. So we did a lot of comparison testing with that version. And, um, you know, we, we managed to get the, the input delay, you know, better than, than that version by a couple of frames. Um, so we, we just really focused on getting the best possible experience we could. We, but we also realized, you know, this is a Game Boy Color game. So we couldn't easily do things like adding widescreen support, for example. So there are, there are still limitations of, of this version, but I think ultimately, you know, we, we, we could, we provided the best version that we possibly could. And uh, there was a version for the Wii U as well. Um, why did you guys decide to go with the Game Boy Color version instead of just uh, porting that Wii U one across? Um, not really sure. Um, I think it was just this is what Way Forward wants, and this is what we're doing. You know, so the the business side or the decision making process of of of, of the projects um, was kind of already signed. You know, before I got there. So um, that, that's 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 probably a couple of levels higher than my pay grade, Ravi. <laughs> well, are, are you like an official Switch dev now? Can you uh, do other Switch projects as well and stuff? Yeah, I am. So uh, there's been a couple of other games that I've already shipped for the Switch. The first one is Strife by um, that we released for Night Dive Studios. Now, you guys may remember Strife as the id tech one game that ran on the doom engine that uh, came FPS out. I think it was, one. yeah yeah, it, it, yeah it's the fps with the rpg elements in it and um the narrative um storyline and and everything so strife was my first project at night dive and uh so that actually released digitally last year for the switch and it's actually i think limited run is is got a physical for it right now um so yeah um there are other switch projects that i've already worked on and I'm currently working on it at the moment. So, yeah, um, official Switch developer. You know, I do love the Switch, and I've got a PlayStation 5, I've got an Xbox, but really, if I'm playing modern games, the Switch is my go-to system, because I think it just suits those pick-up-and-play, and, like, the retro titles feel so at home in it as well. I mean, is that kind of the system that you're really focused on, or do you ever maybe think about doing some ports back to older systems again and maybe releasing some titles on classic consoles or computers? Is that anything in the pipeline? I'd love to go back and, and do more Amiga stuff and maybe some older consoles. It's just very difficult to find the time these days with YouTube and 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 game development. It's it's really taking up most of my time. So, uh, but with that said, I'm always thinking about you know cool and interesting, fun things that I can do. So I don't want to close the door on that for sure. I'd love to um, you know pick up a, a PS2 or something and port a game to it or, or, or run some code on there. So I guess the answer to that is, um, you know, never say never. I, I'm, I'm always looking, you know, for something interesting to make. You know, it kind of feels as well like um, I was watching Amiga Bill's video that he did kind of talking about new Amiga games that came out last year. And it just feels like, you know, they just feel more active, these older platforms with new titles than they have in years. It's like, you know, got such a, a loyal and really professional titles that are coming out as well that, you know, probably could have been big commercial hits back in the day, I think. For sure. I just saw... Uh, I saw Doom running on the Amiga 500 recently, you know, yeah. I mean, stuff like that, you know, it's things have really progressed, you know, so far beyond I could, you know, I could ever possibly imagine. And I think a lot of it has to do with, um, you know, the limitations people, developers love, you know, breaking, breaking the limitations of, of what's possible, breaking the boundaries of what's possible. And um, the, the dev tools are really good as well these days. And, and development can be done so much faster. I mean, you know, we talk about, you know, Doom on the Amiga 500. I mean, that that was something that was just, was never a possibility. There were so many attempts made, but it just never seemed to be quite there, did it? You know, you always needed like at least an 020 or an 030 to, to get something decent running, right? Um, yeah. And I think, you know, 
now you have emulators like WinUAE and you can essentially make these games without even needing the hardware anymore. And I think a lot of people, uh, you know, the, the barrier of entry is so much easier now and, and the, a lot of people are just really focused on making the best games that they can. So I, I, I love that stuff. I, I, I love seeing it and I just, you know, I, I always get really amazed and surprised when I see, you know, things like, like Doom on the Amiga running for sure. Well, when you're doing like professional ports, um, it's, is there a kind of a, a difference to uh, doing homebrew ports? And, you know, you're going to have more eyes on it and stuff. And did your code have to be a lot like cleaner? And do you have to hit certain targets and like standards? Yep, uh, absolutely. So there's always going to be stakeholders involved, right, um, in the project. You have to make sure that um, what you deliver is going to pass what's called certification. So when 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 you make your game or when you make your port, there's usually a QA process, right? Where you know a QA team of people will will test your game for bugs and stuff, make sure that there's no crashes and and, and whatnot. Uh, but once it kind of gets past that, then the game needs to get submitted. And we'll just use Nintendo for an example. It gets submitted to Nintendo for certification. And basically, um, the reason why certification happens is to ensure that your game doesn't like brick the hardware or it doesn't do anything that it shouldn't be doing, like formatting the memory card or um, disabling the joy cons or just, just stuff like that, you know, kind of system level stuff that, you know, your game should be playing nice with. So um, there's a lot of rigorous testing that happens there. And that usually lasts for a couple of weeks, that process. And more often than not, you won't pass first time. They'll, they'll kick it back to you and say, look, you need to fix this. You know, I, w- when I docked the switch, um, the game crashed. Or when I undocked the switch, the game crashed. Stuff like that. You know, these kind of edge cases that you don't necessarily think about as a developer. But Nintendo is testing cause to make sure that, again, your game isn't breaking the hardware or it's, or it's hard freezing it or anything like that. So there is a lot of, lot of stakeholders that are involved, you know, in, in the whole thing. And, um, you know, it's not as easy as just making your homebrew port and then uploading it to, uh, you know, to, to GitHub, you know, and saying this is version one, right? Because it's mostly been you that has, has worked on that and no one else. Maybe there's some other people, you know, that, that have helped you out. Um, but ultimately, you know, everyone that's involved is trying to deliver a quality product that will, you know, be a great experience for, for the fans. So I think, you know, that's probably the main difference. And you're not kind of waiting for a couple of um, comments on a forum and uh, <laughs> then just do a little bug update, you know? <laughs> that's right. But I mean, Twitter is Twitter is Twitter, and I still get comments from people. Um, good, you know, mostly, you know, I'll say 99%, a lot of people are really, really happy. Um, but you get that occasional person that's like, why'd you do this? And, and you know, why does this happen? And all that sort of stuff. But that, that's that's everywhere. It's not not really, you know, just uh, in you know in, in in video games. You always get one or two. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, of course, we're going to talk about um, your latest project, this incredible update of Quake that we've been talking about on the podcast. And you know, as soon as that dropped on Xbox Game Pass, I was there on day one, playing it and downloading it. Um, I mean, let, let's talk a bit about FPS games first, because it will be quite interesting to kind of hear your kind of backstory there. Because I remember, you know, first checking out. Wolfenstein 3D I actually started running in a in a shop and my jaw dropped when I saw that game and then I got a few for the Amiga but then when Doom landed and Quake in particular I mean that was such a, a landmark I mean what kind of FPS games were you into back in the day and do you remember your earliest experiences with them I think the same as you Dan um for me I was in college when I first saw Wolfenstein and it was like on a 286 I want to say or maybe a 386 and I, I was just completely blown away by what I had seen. You know, I was immediately I thought, this is like something that I know that the Amiga can't do, you know. Um, and I was all, yeah. automatically very, very envious of it at that point. Um, so for me, it all started with Wolfenstein. Um, and I, I love I love playing Wolfenstein, but you could you could tell it was quite limited in in what it could do. But then when Doom came out a couple of years later, it was, I mean, that was just absolutely crazy. You know, I was, I think it was in my final year of college um, when when Doom came out and um, played that game so much. I mean, we did the IPX um, networking stuff and and everything in the computer labs and stuff. It was, it was a good time. But I think for me, you know, Quake was probably the, the biggest influence um, for me because I was just in awe of, of the fact that 
how fast technology had advanced where it wasn't you know sprites it wasn't sprite based anymore in in a ray caster it was fully 3d you know that um it had advanced so fast in making these 3d worlds even though you know you go back and they look primitive these days um just the 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 tech that was around id tech you know and, and quake was was amazing to me so if you kind of follow that track of games that's kind of where um, I really got into FPS, but of course, you know, um, Duke Nukem 3D is another game that I, I have to have to mention because that was one that really I spent many many hours playing across different versions as well. Because um, I loved the uh, obviously the PC version, but I also played that um, some some console versions as well, which weren't as good, but it was always a good time playing playing that game. But it's software and, and 3D realms for me was really the, the the big ones that that got got me really into the the FPS genre and then from there I mean I think it just kind of naturally progressed into you know what we what we see today well what upgrades did you have to do to to get your PC to keep up with these kind of new developments <laughs> I remember at the time when I was in college I had a 486 and it was a I think it was like a DX66 and it ran Wolfenstein and Doom really well but Quake um, it ran at maybe like five frames per second. It wasn't very good. I ended up getting an upgrade to a Pentium, which ran Quake better, but it still wasn't wasn't great. I think, you know, for me, I was trying to stay ahead of the curve, if you will, trying to keep these, you know, keep these um, updates going. But as, as a poor college student at the time, um, there was no way that I could, you know. So I was just reading these things in magazines and hearing about how, you know, the fastest Pentium machines could run full screen Quake, you know, at 30 frames per second or actually probably wasn't that much. It was probably 20 frames per second. And I was just an absolute awe of that. But I think when things really started was probably a couple of years after that was when I picked up a um, a 3D FX Voodoo card. Just, I think it was the original Voodoo 1. And I bought it specifically because GL Quake just got released. And I remember it really well. I, I, I specifically bought the card for GL Quake. And man, I was not I was not disappointed. You know, um, as soon as I put that thing in and, and ran GL Quake, I mean, you could immediately notice the difference as far as A, the way that the game looked and B, more importantly, the frame rate. It was just silky smooth. And I think, I mean, that's kind of how it all started for me. I mean, that wasn't a cheap time to be a PC gamer. You know, the, it, it was like massive jumps every couple of years, wasn't it? If it you look was. at like, you know, what PC games were like in 1990 compared to 1999, it's unrecognizable. Absolutely. At the end of the decade. Yeah, and I, I tried to keep up with computer upgrades, you know, um, and I was focused, I think most of us would focus on on the GPUs, you know. So I went from like a, a Voodoo to a Voodoo 2, and then I went to a Voodoo 3, but then I then kind of it went to like a Voodoo Five, and I I kind of lost interest. And and I think Nvidia at the time was really pushing their GPUs. Um, they had like the I can't remember the, the GTS series and stuff like that. Um, mm. The MX cards. Uh, so I jumped on board with Nvidia because they were also very very powerful, but they were cheaper as well. And you could see there was a shift, you know, coming with with G, GPU technology and graphics and everything. You know, implementing these these really cool effects like transforming and lighting, TNL stuff like that. And um, I was reading Carmack's uh, plan files because uh, he was always like benchmarking these new GPU cards and stuff. And there were these websites as well, like Guru 3D, which I think is still around today, that that were benchmarking graphics cards. And I was always like wanting to get something something new. And I didn't buy every iteration of GPU. Um, generation, but I, I was, I probably jumped like every, I kind of leapfrogged, you know, I was every other GPU upgrade I, I would buy um, tr- to try to keep up to date with things, but it, it kind of got pretty crazy, like you said. Well, obviously, I mean, you know how Quake works, having worked on this new version of it. I mean, kind of looking under the hood of Quake, I mean, how much of the code base of Doom was in there? Was there anything in there? And are they similar in any way, the way they work? Not really. A lot of it was a complete departure from doom there's a couple of things that um that they kind of brought along there was like a a memory management system that was built that kind of had its uh, an original roots from doom but really they almost threw the rule book out you know with doom and, and and started over you know if you look at the two code bases i mean they were both open source you can you can download and take a look but there's really not that much 
between the two that is quite common. It's um, it's something that they, I don't want to say they started from scratch when 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 Carmack started writing Quake, but um, I think they really just thought rethought how how these games should be made, and and I think you know Quake ultimately ended up being quite different. Well, you ended up doing a port of Quake for the uh, original Xbox, uh, Quake X. Yep. And uh, what was the story there and kind of why wasn't there a, a, a decent port for the Xbox? You know, I don't really know why there wasn't a decent port for the Xbox. Um, I kind of feel like there should have been, especially in 2001 when the Xbox, or well, the OG Xbox came out. Now, I think there was, um, oh no, there wasn't a Quake 2 either. That was later with the 360. That was a hidden unlockable with with Quake 4, I believe. So, yeah, I, I don't know why that they, there wasn't an official port. Maybe it had to do with the fact that when um, Carmack had released the source to Quake 1, maybe it was considered, you know, we should, publishers shouldn't really mess with this because it's kind of open source. It's for the community, you know? So maybe there was some thought that, well, we shouldn't actually make a console version of this, you know, because you can just download the source and build it yourself type of thing. And so, yeah, to answer that part, I'm not really too sure, but Quake X was my kind of curiosity you know um i knew the code was out there and i wanted to see what it would be like running on the on the og xbox it ended up coming out coming out really well and uh there were a couple of other people that kind of jumped on board that project and helped out we got like quake world running on it so we could we could get really good networking on that game and uh, we made sure that mods could be loaded and stuff like that. So it just ended up being another kind of project for me. But it was also one that was quite memorable, especially now, you know, thinking about it all those years ago, you know, with obviously with the the, the um, official, you know, version that was just released. So obviously the original Xbox had, you know, quite a lot in common with the, the PC platform. Do you think it was a, a more logical system and it was easier to kind of run it on there than something like a, a PlayStation or a Dreamcast, for example? Uh, yes and no. I think the original Xbox, you know, because it, it is essentially a, a PC underneath the hood, it's got the same, you know, Celeron and, or Pentium 3 microprocessor that x86 PCs at the time did. In one in one regard, it, it was easier because you could just get code up and running pretty quickly. But where it got tricky was the, the rendering side, the, 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 you know, the GPU side, because at the time there was only two choices. You had software rendering which was what Quake initially had shipped with. But then later on, they added GL Quake. Um, obviously, the Xbox had a pretty powerful GPU at the time, but unfortunately, it didn't handle OpenGL. So you'd have to actually reconstruct the game to run with DirectX, which is what the Xbox had. So I remember at the time, I, I was thinking, well, should I try to you know, rebuild the GPU layer and, and make it run in DirectX? And in the end, I just kind of fell back to um, software rendering, which worked, which worked fine, but it wasn't, I guess, the optimal version. We, we, you know, it could have, could have run a lot better, and it could have looked a lot better. Ultimately, you know, running that flavor of GL Quake, but, um, you know, I, I think for the most part, the port was was pretty easy to do, and you know, the Xbox obviously does share a lot of similarities with the PC. So I think, at the end of the day, it wasn't too difficult to get that game up and running. Well, the release actually coincided with uh, QuakeCon which has been running since uh, 1996, amazingly. Um, have you ever actually been to QuakeCon? Or you know, I, I actually, I haven't, um, unfortunately. And, and this year would have been the first time I would have been able to go uh, as a developer. Um, but, I mean, it was virtual this year. And, and I did watch the live streams because we, uh, we obviously were going to uh, shadow drop Quake at QuakeCon. So we knew that was all going to happen. But man, it would have been nice to actually been there in person this year. But um, but you never know, you know. Um, there were, there may be other opportunities that come up um, in the future. But I would definitely love to to attend a Quake World. I think it would be something really special. I can't think of uh, uh, another kind of event that's gone on that long and had that kind of community uh, around the FPS. Um, maybe there are others, but QuakeCon seems to be kind of the king. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think. Yeah, like you mentioned, maybe maybe BlizzCon is something that, well, I don't even think BlizzCon would compare as, as far as number of years, but yeah, QuakeCon is definitely, um, it's a great event. You know, it's obviously a community-driven event, but there's also some really cool surprises that happen every single year. And, you know, we we're very, very lucky this year to be asked to, um, you know, get Quake running on modern consoles and, and have it available for QuakeCon, I think, 
it was a really hype announcement. Well, let's talk about that then. Obviously, this remastered version of Quake um, developed by you and the, the Night Dive Studios crew is out there now. It's on um, Windows, Switch, PlayStation 4 and 5, Xbox One, um, Xbox Series X and S, mm-hmm. available on all these platforms. What was kind of the story of this project then? How did it get started? So the way it got started, and I want to say that I wasn't actually with the company at the time, but I, I've heard this story multiple times from you know the higher-ups at Night Dive. But um, if you recall, Night Dive did um, Doom 64 um, back in 2019, I believe. So they released Doom yeah. 64 for modern platforms. So they already had a, a relationship, a working relationship with id Software and Bethesda. And I believe that the story goes at QuakeCon 2019, which was the last, I guess, physical Quake event um, before COVID, there was, a, there was a dinner one night and the question was asked, well, what's it going to take for us to, to make Quake for you guys? And um, I think essentially that's how it all started. You know, they, uh, id Software and Bethesda loved the work that, that was done with Doom 64 and um, they knew that, you know, we could do a, a, a high quality Quake uh, product. So the deal got signed and um, I started working on the project um, almost when, when the project just got signed. So it was actually in development for just over a year, um, which sounds like a pretty long time just for you know a game, I don't want to say as small as Quake because that would be a little unfair to say, but there's definitely a lot of moving parts you know, when, when it came to this particular port. But um, it, was, uh, it was pretty exciting to, to, be, you know, be, to be able to work on that project for sure. Why kind of update the original rather than just like go through it all and make a HD remake and, you know, <laughs> Unreal Engine style? And <laughs> Yeah, um, that's a good question. I mean, I think a lot of people wanted um, Quake, you know, to come back because the, if you recall, it only ever ended up on the Nintendo 64 many, many years ago, right? So there was no console version of Quake that it had ever released. Um, after the N64 version, which was, I think it was in like 96 or something. So there was a lot of lot of um, people that wanted Quake to come back. And I think the way that we do things at Night Dive Studios is it's really about bringing quality of life features for, to a modern, you know, for a modern console experience, you know, to, to our audience. So, you know, we could have just as easily just ported Quake and and shipped it. You know, the way that you kind of remember it, right? But um, that's not nece- that's not the way that we we want to do things. You know, if you look at the what, what we've done with like Turok and Turok Two, the the current ports of those and Doom sixty four, you know, we want to add that um, HD flavor to it. We want to give it, you know, we want to give it sixty frames per second. We want to add widescreen support. Um, if you've got an ultra wide monitor on your PC, we want to support that. You know, we want to we want to support gyro controls. If if you've got um, haptics or rumble, you know, we want to we want to include that. Uh, Post processing effects, you know, shadowing and, and lighting, new new things that that weren't in the game. Um, update the models a little bit, but also we we also want to be very careful that we don't, you know, take away from what made the game so great. So we we don't want to necessarily. Um, you know, engine swap the game, you know, to Unreal Engine or, or Unity because it never ran on those engines, right? We we want to keep the source material the same. So the way that it plays and, and the way that you remember how it plays doesn't change. It just looks a lot nicer. And, and again, as mentioned, it takes advantage of, you know, modern, modern consoles. Well, uh, a great feature of it is actually um, multiplayer and uh, cross-play as well, being able to play on all the different systems all together against each other. Um, w- w- was that uh, uh, tough to implement? And um, did you guys get any work done? Or did you just sit there and play the multiplayer game? It was, um, there was a lot of work. In fact, I'll say that the multiplayer side probably accounted for two thirds of the game development. It was, um, it was very, very difficult at times. Um, and there was a lot of stuff to do. So we always wanted to add multiplayer and we also we always wanted to make it cross play and you know as you know you can it doesn't matter what what version you're running on what system you can connect to a server and play now obviously that's a little unfair especially if you're up against pc players that are going to destroy you but we didn't want to limit the ability to um to have cross play and as far as multiplayer testing we did a lot of it it wasn't just playing multiplayer games but we did a lot of testing with um, the multiplayer, pretty much every week we would have 
multiplayer sessions where we would all play together. Um, and the great thing about working at Night Dive is we're a virtual company, so there's actually no physical office anywhere. Um, and basically, we had people that work around the world. So we've got we've got developers that, that live in New Zealand. We have some in Europe. We have some in the US. So we did a lot of focus testing to make sure that the multiplayer was, was in good shape. And we wanted to make sure that if we were going to ship this game, then the multiplayer would be rock solid. And I think um, it's been it's been received really well. Were there any other um, difficult parts to transfer over to consoles or update to modern standards? I think ultimately, not really, but, well, you mentioned, you know, we, we shipped the game on, I think it was five different systems on the same day. So it was really just about making sure that um, all the versions of the game um, for each platform ran well. We wanted to make sure that every version ran at 60 and initially, the switch was was something that, um, being the switch, it's it's a, a lot less powerful than you know the PS4 and the PS5 and, and and what have you. So there was more optimizations done to get the switch version running um, at sixty. We we weren't gonna be satisfied with anything less, and so we we did spend a bit of time on the switch version, making sure that um, you know the experience there was was good, and it, it turned out really well. But um, apart from that, really. Not nothing. There wasn't really anything else for me. I mean, Quake. You know, the the source code is out there and it's it's very well established. So, again, we didn't deviate too far away from you know the the, the code that was there. Um, so we knew that it was going to be um, a pretty good product, no matter what what platform it ran on. Well, we didn't kind of know you were involved until you dropped that video about how how you were a dev on the um, game. And uh, what's the reaction been like? And I bet you were really excited to kind of tell everybody the news. Uh, it was it was a dream come true, Ravi. I mean, you know, we mentioned earlier that I, I grew up playing Quake. You know, when I was in my twenties, you know, um, I, I loved the game so much, and I spent hours and hours and hours playing it and being involved in in the the project of remastering that game you know in 2021 all those years later to celebrate quake's anniversary i mean i just kind of pinch myself and say you really are a lucky a lucky guy you know um and i think for me uh it's it's probably the best project i've been involved with and um you know it may well end up being the best project i've been involved with but uh, I just, I'm just very, very lucky and, and very happy that I got the opportunity and um, the fans uh, have, have responded well to it. Well, this might be something that you can't answer. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, are there any plans to do any more move like Quake 2 or something based on the Quake engine, like, you know, Hexen 2, something like that um, in the future? I, I, I can't answer that because at the moment um, we don't have any plans. But um, one thing I will say is, you know, there's always – our business development uh, team at Night Dive are always looking um, for the next thing to do, right? So, who knows? You know, stay tuned. We we may have we may have that come up in the future, but right now, um, no, there's no plans. Well, what what you can answer is about your channel, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> we were just uh, wondering for our last question: um, what do you kind of have planned for the channel? Have you got any uh, videos that you've been preparing? No, um, I have no idea. Like, <laughs> um, no, yeah, like I, like I said, uh, you know, earlier, like nothing has really changed. You know, like I, I tend to shoot from the hip quite a bit, and um, whatever feels good. You know, um, like I mean, that's that's not entirely true. I do have a bit, you know, a somewhat of an Excel spreadsheet where I just kind of scribble down video ideas that that I've that I'm thinking about. But right now, um, I'm just having fun. You know, it's it's been. Something where um, you know I'll I'll just read up on on uh, some interesting emulation topic you know from the early days or um, or or uh, I'll, I'll read about um, security on a, a, a console that I wasn't familiar with and and that's that's all it takes you know I'm sitting there deep diving into it and writing scripts and everything so I tend to not really have a roadmap of, of what I want to do but um, I guess you know short term. The new OLED switches is, is about to get released, so I'm definitely going to be tearing one of those things apart and and doing a tear down and 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 you know looking inside of that thing. Um, that's definitely something I, I want to do, you know, in the short term. But ap- apart from that, I mean, uh, who knows? Just just keep watching, and um, you know, and you'll keep being surprised, I guess. Well, keep up the amazing work on the channel. Um, you know, I'm really pleased everything's going so well for you, and uh, you know, amazing work with uh, Quake too. You know, I've been loving the remaster, and I'm sure that. Anyone that hasn't played it already after listening to this will give it a, a purchase. So, um, 
It's always fantastic to catch up with you, Demetrius, and uh, I look forward to next time you're on, hopefully. Me too, gents. Thanks for having me on, and um, yeah, until next time. 